Months back, uh, if you recall, we had a conversation with Earl Hebner, uh, the famed uh, uh, referee, a wrestling referee that uh, spent many, many years with the uh, WWF slash WWE. And uh, if you remember, we had a great talk about his career uh, along with his uh, twin brother, Dave. If we talk about twins, see, those two actually like each other. But anyway, we won't get into that because we've already discussed uh, Ian Mooney. But no, but Earl and, uh, and Dave, uh, just uh, what, uh, you know, an incredible road they traveled. And, uh, you know, it's all in the family because Earl's son, Brian Hebner, uh, also became a referee following in his father and uncle's footsteps and uh, spent a number of years with the WWE as well as uh, Impact Wrestling. And he is now with the new NWA. And uh, Brian is, uh, you know, he's traveling his own path now, carrying on the Hebner legacy in professional wrestling. And with that, let's get to my conversation with Brian Hebner. Ding, ding, ding. You know, folks, during my time with the WWF, I was privileged to see some of the greatest athletes in the world of professional wrestling in the ring. Uh, I also witnessed some of the greatest matches take place. But none could have ever reached that level of greatness in the ring without a great third man in that squared circle. Uh, The referees who know how to provide just the right amount of authority and then knowing when to stay out of the way and also be able to take a good bump now and then when they needed to. And I got a chance to see two of the best uh, in the world out there uh, work right in the WWF, Earl and Dave Hebner. You guys know their names uh, very well, especially if you followed what was happening in the 80s and 90s. Well, that lineage has continued on with Earl's son, Brian Hebner, who has also become a great referee. He's worked with the WWE as well as Impact Wrestling and uh, other organizations. And now he is part of the movement, as I like to call it, the NWA and its power show. Brian, uh, welcome to Primetime. How are you? Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it very much, man. It's an honor and privilege to be on the show. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, uh, I I got the chance to to work closely with your your dad and your uncle. And, uh, you know, they, they were part of that movement. Like back then, uh, you know, prior to that, you'd have, you know, referees would get involved. Uh, they'd take a bump here and then, take, a, you know, a shot, get knocked out or whatever. But they took it to a new level. And, it, and the way they came into the WWF at the time uh, was through this tremendous angle as they worked the, the twin angle with, uh, with the, you know, the Hulkster and, uh, you know, it, it was just a, a great way. And I think it changed the way people looked at referees forever. And I don't know... Uh, if you remember that really well, but uh, what what do you recall of your your uh, your dad and your uncle at that time in the WWF? I mean, they were stars. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of uh, interesting on my on my take. Uh, I just remember many years. Dave uh, David had worked for the WWF, um, and then my dad, of course, was at the uh, NWA Jim Crockett Promotions. Right. Um, yeah, so and I did a lot of traveling as a as a little kid with my dad um, on a school bus, setting up rings and stuff like that. And I and I always remember there was like this little competition between you know Uncle Dave and, and my dad. Really, and it, it was friendly. It wasn't you know no no you know nothing major, but you could tell you know obviously they wouldn't let me in on much because I was I was a young man. Right. And uh, that one day I just remember uh, my dad saying. Hey, uh, uh, I want you to do me a favor. I said, okay. He said, I want you to watch uh, Saturday Night Main Event. I yeah. said, okay. Um, and I'm in the back of my mind. I didn't say anything because he knew was you know he knew I was a mark and I was going to watch it anyway. So <laughs> he, he, you know, so I just wanted to say, but I didn't. I just was like, why would you tell me to watch Uncle Dave tonight? That, that's really strange. But I didn't say anything. So I watched it. I, I remember like yesterday, I was at one of my other friends' house. His name was Brian. And we were both sitting at the house, and we always watched it on Saturday nights, as, as we did everything that came on Wrestle Miles. And I told him what was going on. I said, my dad said to watch it. And he's like, that's interesting, because he knew the deal, too. And I was like, yeah. I said, well, let's check it out. So ultimately, the match began, and I knew something was, was going on. I knew, but didn't know, which was weird, um, because I can tell my dad and my Uncle Dave apart like, like nobody's business. Right, yeah. And a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people sure. struggle with it. But I, I don't, and I never have. But I thought for a minute, is that my dad? And I was like, no. Yeah. He, okay. he would call me. But I was like, David does look really good tonight. It looks like he's lost some weight. <laughs> <laughs> and 
because David was always the heavier set yeah. one, you know, and yeah, that little belly, you yeah. know, yeah. yeah. Um, so ultimately, the angle absolutely went into play, and I was like, oh my gosh, my yeah. dad is in the WWF, and it was it was it was huge for me as a kid. Like it just was, it was awesome. Um, I, I never was, you know, in the know to to know that this was even going on. That was never in conversation. That was negotiated. Nothing. Which you know, at that time, I don't even remember how old I was. I know I was probably fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, something like that. And uh, it was just really, really cool, really cool moment for me and my friends. And which I know this is how ridiculous it sounds, but my friends. And it was just like you know, it, it was just really, really neat. Yeah. So it was, it was a pretty interesting moment. Oh, that's that's awesome. I'd never heard that story. Uh, that's just uh, fantastic to think. You know, I always walked, I looked at that perspective because. You know, uh, unless you were around them a lot, you really, you couldn't tell the difference. I mean, it was very easy to be fooled. But uh, that's funny that you're like, for a second, go, uh, is that my dad? But, you know. Yeah, but, it was. Yeah, but back then, uh, and you mentioned, you know, Dave, of course, uh, was up first with the WWF. And uh, your dad in uh, the other organization that was also, you know, like very big. It was, there was those those organizations organizations were still, you know, big draws in different parts of the country. And and yes. uh, in a sense, I mean, was there a, a healthy competition? You, I think you kind of hit on it between the two of them. And uh, was there always this feeling that your dad wanted to be in the WWF as well? You know, it was weird. Uh this is my take on for what I remembered. Yeah. Um, I, I remember my dad saying several times, you know, uh, David wants me to come up there with him and, you know, and it was like a, a I, I don't know how to describe the sound of what I'm trying to make, but like, it was like, it was a thought, but not, it wasn't a real thought. Like, yeah. so, you know, eh, you know, I, I don't know that just, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing that, you know, that kind of thing. And I remember also that, it came to a point where David was a full-time referee and my dad really was not. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, he was a full-time referee, right. but he had so many other like uh, uh, hats he was yeah, wearing at the time. Yeah, right. Yeah, and um, obviously I think there was a pay difference. You know what I mean? I think I think David was doing well. Yeah. Uh, my dad was doing well, but he was just working a lot harder to do well. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> Which is fine. My, never, my, my dad has never been afraid of work. That's the one thing about my dad I will tell you. He's the hardest working SOB I've ever seen in my life. But sometimes it makes me so sick that I can't have that gene. Yeah. Um, but I think I think it was just a matter of them putting a, a something together that was intriguing to my dad to where he could get rid of all these hats and focus on the one thing that he really wanted to do. Um, I think ultimately that's what it came down to, in my honest opinion. Yeah, and and, the, and there was that feeling that that was the big show, I mean, that, you know, you wanted to go to the major leagues and was, uh, you know, that – a sense in his mind that what like you said had the time had to be right but i what i would think that that would have always been a goal of his yeah and i always also remember too he was a little bit remorseful too because he, he's a loyal guy yeah. you know and, I, and that's that's rubbed off in, on me as well I'm a, I'm a very loyal guy as far as as far as believing in what you believe and who takes care of you and i think it was a really tough decision for him i believe hmm. um but ultimately i think that he knew it was best for him and his family and everyone involved and let's 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 not be uh i don't even know the word to use here let's let's not be frugal about saying twins have a special connection that most people don't have brothers and sisters can never match what right. twins have yeah um me being a, a dad of twin daughters myself it's it's in the family there's a special bond yeah yeah <laughs> it's a special bond that you know they're mean as shit to each other but man they gotta be together you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. just kind of crazy well it is and um you know, when, uh, you know, the, the Dave was there and uh, was a, you know, quite an established referee. And I'm, I'm sure you're thinking, you know, uh, well, I, I look like him. So how, uh, you know, you can go up there for like maybe thinking. I, and I, I even remember Earl saying that, that he was thinking it was going to be kind of a one off. You know, I mean, what else you, what else are you going to do? And yet right. uh, it kept going. And then eventually, uh, you know, they became a big part of the. Uh, of what was going on there. And, uh, you know, like I said, it really, it changed the, the way referees were looked at. I mean, they became personalities, which allowed some of these other guys, you know, that, uh, you know, Danny Davis and, you know, where they started to become, um, you know, part of the show. 
They still knew when to stay out of the, the light. But at the same time, they were recognized personalities. And do you remember uh, as a kid when that they were you know, celebrities? Do you, do you remember actually being aware of that? Um, it was kind of hard not to be because every pay-per-view, every major wrestling moment, I had to go to school. And these kids were smart. I mean, yeah. they... They, you know, it was almost like I was kind of a little famous little kid, but, uh-huh. but I knew I wasn't, you know what I mean? But uh-huh. I, I was more like, I was more like the, uh, the info guy that you got to have info. Cause I know your dad and your uncle get it all. Oh, right. You know yeah. what I mean? It was the, you know, or something happened and God forbid hit did that my dad screwed somebody over or which we obviously know did happen, but I was obviously yeah. out of school, but, um, uh, you know, little bad things like that, or it takes a bump in the and the heel goes over, and then the kids are like, oh, your dad sucks, you know, and, you know and whatever. And I'm just like, yeah. yeah, sure. My dad's bigger than yours, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, no, I, I, I honestly knew that there was, there was a, a, a bigger, bigger star of a person that walks around the earth, you know, that was there. Yeah, absolutely, I did. Yeah, so, I mean, were you really born into it as far as the, the business? I mean, was that always a, a huge part of your life? Or early on, did you have, uh, besides your friends bugging the crap out of you to give them the scoop on stuff, but a, what you describe as a, a normal life that, uh, you know, like anybody else, or did you always feel like I'm going to be part of this business at some point? Uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I get asked a lot. And it's, it's, a, it's a question that's really, it's, uh, okay, so let me just go back to this. So all the way through school till about middle school. Yeah. I knew I wanted to be a referee. And at middle school, I became um, very athletic. Not that I wasn't before, but I didn't understand. I had some great athletic ability that was better than others. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, I can I can maybe play this baseball thing and maybe do this basketball thing and maybe be a wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Which I think is natural for anybody that loves the business. Of course, they want to be a referee. Nobody's looking, I mean, be a wrestler. Nobody's looking to be a referee in my opinion at that age. Um, and then finally I got to high school and obviously wrestling is still deep, deep, deep in my blood. And, um, that's when I realized I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just basically an average guy. That's just really good around here. You know? And then I was like, uh, I can, I can get a, get a, you know, part-time little gig at a, at a college, no, nothing major full-time deal, but I can you know go to college, play some ball. And then I decided, well, you know what? I don't want to waste my time in these years and not really be able to be a bigger player or athlete than I think I could be. Mm-hmm. So all that said in a nutshell, from elementary school all the way through middle school to about high school, I had a false hope of being an athlete to 100% all in of being a referee. But I knew, I knew, and that was why it was easy for me to shake the part about being a baseball player or, or, or being a basketball player was so easy to do because I was like, well, I already know what I'm doing and I already know what I was meant to be doing. Yeah. So it was no biggie. So I passed, passed up college and everything to get some training, to get uh, my feet wet and get myself in business. And uh, so it worked out, obviously. Yeah. But how did your dad feel about that though, uh, growing up? Because, uh, you know, I'm sure you witnessed, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tough business and uh, for people to get to even a certain level, re- regardless if you are in that ring, uh, you got to be uh, a cut above the rest, and that includes referees. Yeah. And and did he just try and discourage you from uh, going to the business? Say, you know, go to college, get a real job, or did he just realize that uh, that wasn't going to happen? You you were you had other plans. I think he wanted to see me go to college and get an education, and he actually did say that yeah. at one point. But I mean, I, I think he kind of gave in to the fact that I was ready to do what he always wanted to do. And I think it was just hard for him to say, well, you're, you're not being smart when it was what he did. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, it's just like, you know, as a dad, it's like, you see your son do something stupid, you know, and and you're like, why would you do that? And he's like, dad, you did it. You told me about it. And it's like, oh yeah, I did. You know, okay. Okay. (laughs) You know? (laughs) So, I mean, I think he kind of had, he was on a rock and a hard stone with, with, with what to say and how to say it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So at that point, did uh, when he realized that that was the path you had chosen, um, did he say, "Okay, let me show you how to do this"? 
Yes, he became very excited and very vested. Yes, yeah, that's cool. And, and uh, you know, uh, you know as well as I do that uh, that that uh, especially that period of time when you were growing up, and uh, you know, and beyond when your dad was working. Uh, how often mm-hmm. did you see him? Because I I know he kept the same schedule as the uh, the superstars did. Um, and how yeah? You know, how often? I don't even remember what his road schedule must have been like, but. Uh, what do you remember of that, and how often did you get a chance to actually spend time with your dad? Um, as a kid, it was uh, not much, not much, because my mom and him had also separated and divorced, and uh, um, I didn't even remember that part. So it wasn't. A, I'm not trying to be a everybody to be so sad. I'm saying it was. It was very young in my life when yeah. they separated. So I was always a weekend dad warrior. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but of course, as his schedule and his um, advancement to the WWF happened it was it was it was far in between i mean it was lucky to be two weekends a month it was lucky sometimes to just be one and then sometimes there were none um so it was a very valuable time and for me to get to do the weekend thing with my dad um i saw him a lot more when he was with crockett uh in the nwa because mm-hmm. they did local runs you know right. they were up and down the east coast yeah so i could get picked up and hop in the bus with him and go up and down the east coast and all that kind of thing so i saw him more then but once he went to wwf um there, there was there was a lot of times where we didn't see a lot of him, and uh, it was sad. But you know, you also knew that you know my dad was doing what he had to do to make money to support us, and um, it was what he loved. And um, so, yeah, it was to answer your question, not not a whole lot, not a whole lot. And then when I began to drive, you know, I was able to go see him when he was home. I could take my own time to do that, and uh, so that helped, you know. But but ultimately, with, with no license and him having to do his schedule. Not a whole lot. Yeah, and that was just uh, crazy times when they're doing, you know, all those house shows, and then also the you know the TV tapings and then a, and the pay per views. Uh, but it must have been cool because I know you were backstage uh, several times to to go to some of those events. And are there a few that really stand out to you and experiences with uh, you know hanging out with these superstars uh, of the day? Um, it was, man, because, you know, you have to remember, um, it was always in my blood, like we all know. Yeah. Um, I was with him a lot with Crockett, and so I had met a lot of the guys. I knew a bunch of the guys, but I'd never known some of these where I did think there were, like, there were some bigger stars, you know what I mean? Where I was like, man, like this Randy Macho Man guy, this, you know, these different ones, these different characters. Hulk Hogan was another one, you know, that I'd never met. I knew all about him, but never met. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, I keep going, but I'm saying there's a, there was a bunch of them that I just had never met because I, I wasn't part of that life, that, that WWF life. Um, so, yes, there were a lot of very cool moments where I met some of these guys that, that I really thought were, like, just rock stars, man. I mean, you know what I mean? I just remember mm-hmm. one time my dad says, all right, we're going to go out to eat dinner. Um, Macho and Liz are going to go with us. I just need you to shut your mouth and eat. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> just it was just uh, really cool, man. I mean, I didn't I didn't need to say anything. You know, it was just fun just to be there, just to just to just to meet these guys with, as, as, at the age that I was at, where nobody else was, unless it was somebody you know, else's kid that was in the back. You know, um, it was just yeah. I mean, there was a lot of awe and shocking moments. I mean, there's just so many that honestly that I can't reflect that. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways and different ones. You know what I mean? But there was a bunch. I can tell you that. Uh, yeah. It was a really really cool deal of. Yeah, and it's uh, it's hard for people to understand, I guess, even at that time, because they were rock stars. There's no question about it. I mean, uh, Randy no doubt. and Hulk Hogan and, you know, the list goes on. But at the same time, and I've talked about it, you know, on several occasions, there were, you know, probably a roster of about 60 guys, I think, at uh, different points. But the whole company was pretty small. Uh, that uh, compared to what it is today, my God. But, uh, you know, I've said that, you know, we knew everybody. We knew everybody who was behind the scenes, basically. We knew the the crews that went out uh, because we'd see them at TV tapings. And then, of course, uh, you know, in Stanford, where the headquarters were. But it was in in, in even the, the superstars. It was this kind of this small family, in a sense, and I know that mm-hmm. I haven't been a part of it for, you know, decades, but I know how different it is now. You know, you go there and they have, you know, people have their own buses. I mean, these guys are just gigantic. Yeah. Back then, they still had the blue curtains up with the, you know, and that was your 
locker room, you know? And yeah. I think it was a different time then because uh, many, of, it was, uh, many of them were very down to earth. A lot of these guys had come from smaller territories, had crisscrossed the country and beat up old cars and eaten in just about every diner you could imagine and stayed in every flea bag hotel. So when they did reach that level, they didn't forget that, you know? And so a lot of yep. those guys were, besides the fame that, that came, and some couldn't handle it, as we know, but most of them were pretty down to earth guys, earth, earth guys. And I think, do you remember that, that most of them were like very approachable and, you know, have a conversation oh, yeah. no problem? Yeah, I, I could say this. Um, it, it's, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, yeah. it's today... And this is no knock on anybody because I, I can understand right. why they are because there's money being paid that wasn't being paid before and all that kind of stuff. So I can understand a bunch of it. So I'm not knocking a blue or anything. Yeah. The, the saddest thing I think about for wrestling locker rooms nowadays, to me, is that it's not like you said, bef- like it was before, mm-hmm. um, where they were in it together, man. They, they, they were in it as a team, and, and, and there was competition like the you know Crockett's and uh, the AWA and you know all this other stuff and. I just think that, yes, you're right, that these guys were way more down to earth. Um, now, there were guys that lived with their gimmick, which was cool to me, yeah. um, you know, but they were supposed to because they didn't know me. You know what I mean? They didn't know who I was. Yeah. And if, if they find out it's Earl Hebner's son, you still have to make him believe. You know what I mean? And that's what they did. Yeah, but they I mean, weren't they, no. They, they lived Kayfay, boy. They, they, they never. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, he, but and they some of them even me. just lived it. I mean, Randy was the same guy <laughs> in, in or out of oh, the locker yeah. room. It didn't matter. But it was. It was It was a really unique time in the business. And like you said, it's no knock on, you know, the way these guys come up today. It's it's a different world. You know, you don't Absolutely. have where you, – you don't have the, the time where – times where you know, these guys made their living off the card. It depended on who showed up at that arena. So they were all in it together. And I remember – when you'd come into a locker room and you'd be sitting there and uh, the guys would come in and they, every single one of them would come down the line and shake your hand because it, it's old tradition, but they're basically thanking you for helping to put food on their table, helping them take care of their families. And uh, it's, it's a lot different now, right? And, and maybe that's, that's a down, downfall part of having a contract, but I think most would uh, agree yeah. that it is a better way to live than, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe you'll get this much tonight. So, yeah, but it was right. it was a very special time. So, and with, and with that, uh, that's something that's in your soul. It's probably great that you're different. You know, you're you're uh, another generation of this because not only your dad has passed it on to you, but you saw it. You were there. And and does that uh, still in the in the way you feel you conduct yourself in this business and how you approach it? It is. Um, it is. Uh, I. Uh... I, I work very hard uh, in my own little way, my own nuances that people may not see to create um, kind of what I saw. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much sense that makes to you, but um, I, 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 I just try and carry myself as a friend and, and someone that cares about who I'm with, you know, and um, I think I've done a decent job, I don't, you know, as far as that goes. And, I, you know, I, I don't know or don't think I have any enemies or anything. Um but in this business, as you know, you never know. Yeah. Um, but obviously, if I have one and it's, it's one or two, obviously it doesn't matter, and I don't care. But overall, yeah, man, I just try to bring I try to bring my family to them, you know, and I just try to bring um, friendship, camaraderie, um, and, and try and make when we're out there the best it can be, yeah. like it was back then. You know what I mean? Because you had to be out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that has definitely rubbed off and helped me to try and create a different environment that way it, the way it could possibly be if, it, if, if I didn't do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And with that, I mean, I, I think that you've found a great home now and we will get into that uh, because, you know, people like Nick Aldis is, is uh, somebody who uh, just loves that uh, tradition about professional wrestling and loves to bring that in. And I know that that's kind of the philosophy behind the whole organization. But before we, we get to uh, the movement, as I call it, um, I want to hear more, though, about your path, because once you decided to do this, uh, it wasn't like you just jumped to the WWE. Uh, what was it like for you? And I, I imagine your father felt like you did have to go pay some dues. So were you working small shows? Or how did it really start to where you became better and better at this? So there was uh, 
training, obviously, that me and my dad did. Yeah. And uh, we would focus and work on different ways of doing things. Um, his biggest fear was me getting in a ring when he wasn't around and not doing the proper things. Mm-hmm. So once he realized and thought I was good enough to go, I would do some spot shows here and there. There was a guy named Johnny Ringo. I don't know if you know who he was yeah. or who he is, but anyway, yeah. he uh, he would run some local promotions here in Richmond and a little scattered out. And I would go on those with him, set the ring up, do all the little stuff, you know, do the music, referee, um, and do that kind of stuff. And then eventually, I worked my way into where um, I was able to do a show for a house show for WWE that was in Richmond. Um, Jack Lanza um, was told to take a look at me. Um, Jack Lanza was over the top impressed, thought that I moved extremely well in the ring, thought that my cadence of counting was very good, and thought that I I needed to do more stuff. Mm. So he had brought that up in a meeting. um, I don't know, I guess it was at a TV or whatever that they were at, that, that same weekend. Um, and basically I got called up and they said that they wanted to use me part time on the East coast whenever they were near. And I said, okay. So I would continue to train a little bit, continue to do spot show, spot show, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, ultimately I was doing the dark matches for the house shows up and down the East coast before eventually, uh, JR catching wind and bringing me in as ring crew, um, backstage teardown, and a referee. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was then in charge of me as far as being a referee and putting, he, he was the, ma- the guy who assigned all referees to what matches and shows and all that. Um, then we did the brand split. Um, and before we did the brand split, which I should go back and say, I never was once on TV, never once, but I was there for almost two years before I was even thought about being on TV. I did every dark match. I was at TVs, but I did every dark match and every match that, you know, was not recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, I kept asking my dad, you know, are you ever going to put me on TV? You know, da, 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 da. he's like, you're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. Mm-hmm. Um, so finally, they did do a match that I was on TV. It was when they were doing the MTV Sunday Night Heat, um, which, you know, was an honor for me to do. Yeah. Finally, finally, the brand, brand split happened, and my dad made the moves over who went where. So he separated me and himself, put me on SmackDown. Obviously, he was on Raw, and I was a little upset about that because I was like, you know, finally I get to work with my dad, and yeah. you know, you know, I wanted to do that, travel with my dad, it'd be cool. Uh, I asked him why he didn't do that, and he said, because you don't need to be with me. You need to earn your own name. You don't need to be under mine because anything I do, anything I say will be because I'm prote- protecting you. Yeah. You go on your own yeah. and protect yourself. And I said, okay. So ultimately, um, I was eventually, I worked my way to being SmackDown's lead ref mm-hmm. um, with no help from my dad, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, that was a very, 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 very proud moment of my life. Um, I actually also on my own won referee of the year, uh, voted by the fans. Um, Wrestle, uh, did some WrestleManias. Um, yeah. Also was the referee for Hulk Hogan, Vince McMahon, yeah, which I yes. believe is Wrestle- probably one of the biggest matches is that 14, I'll ever I do. Think. WrestleMania 14? Uh, I think it was nine. Was it nine? It might No, you might be right. Uh, it was in Seattle, I, in the, I know that. My notes here, so. But, okay, you might but be right. That, but regardless, uh, I mean, that that's uh, that's huge. That's huge. I mean, yeah. to be able to do that. And, uh, it was an honor. I mean, it really was. Oh, I bet. And uh, scariest day of my life. How do you, you know, how do you work your way up in that that situation? Because you've got uh, you know, a lot of guys. A lot of guys been there for years. I mean, Chioda and all those. You know, God, he's still there. But uh, yeah, how, how do you work? You know, like you said, you were lead ref in for Raw. And how does that work? Is it, you know, uh, the boys re- request to have you in there, or the, I should say. The, ladies as well but you know are the the superstars request or is it kind of them you know management seeing hey he, t- he does a good job in there but how does that work um the way it worked for me in my opinion I, and I, I don't i don't think i was any better than, a, than the crew that i had on smackdown i had the best crew i mean i really did um 
we had Kyoto, we had Corderas, we had Charles Robinson. Yeah. Um, and I, that wasn't what I thought, you know what I mean? But that was what I was trying to achieve, no, no doubt about it. Um, and I think there was a move made where Kyoto went over to Raw. Um, and I don't remember who we got back for him, but, um, but anyway, it, it's, it's a lot of what you both, like a couple things you said. I mean, there's how shows play a big part in it as well, because you have to build chemistry with the guys. Um, I'll never forget working with Eddie Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero, um, when they were trying to do something with, um, Charlie and Shelton Benjamin. Yeah. Uh, Charlie House and Shelton Benjamin. And we went up and down the road, and I mean, no referee wanted this match. No referee wanted it. I mean, Eddie was, I was the, soul, the, 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 the best, but man, he had a temper on him when things did not go his way. Oh boy. Um, and uh, nobody wanted this match, and I'm being dead serious. This is this, this is a shoot. I mean, I was the only one that said, you know what? Screw it. Give it to me. I'll work through it. I will do it. I don't yeah. care. Me and Eddie built this relationship. Me and Chavo built this relationship. I helped. I helped so much with uh, Charlie and Shelton at that time when they were, you know, getting and fresh in the business and at this stage in their lives. And um, I really believe that helped catapult me in a big way. Um, I also worked very well with uh, Kurt Angle. Um, Kurt Angle was the big star, and him yeah. and Brock Lesnar were the big stars on SmackDown. Kurt Angle immediately drew to me. He loved the way I was able to remember a total match. He loved the way I could call it back. He loved the way that I could help when there were miss. Uh, like say you take a bad bump and you're like shit where am I at I could tell him yeah. um, he liked that I was in his words he liked that I was a ring general and I took pride in knowing the, the entire match and not just the finish yeah. um, Brock Lester and I got along really well he loved working with me he, he loved just saying and he was this way too he would just say we're taking a bump take it and then he would I would just say well, what, what, I would see where we're at and I would just be like okay he's got to roll through here I got to take it I guess <laughs> And I always found a way, you know, to be in, in Brock's head, if that's ever, ever possible. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a lot of that. And this is all through house shows, you know what I mean? Because you can't do that stuff on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the big part of it. And then, then you do take it to TV. Right. And you're prepared. And people see it. Yeah. yeah. And then people do see it. And they're like, man, this little Hebner kid, shit, he's got it, man. He, he, he did a really good job in this thing. You know what I mean? I think it's just a matter of growing yeah. with the talent. Yeah. And then talent ultimately says, hey, uh, Johnny, Ace, or whoever's in control at that point, Arn, uh, I really want Hebner to do this match. You know, he's done a really good job for me on house shows, yada, yada. And I think it's the way it works, you know. And, you know, and there's time cues and there's aunt camera angles and, and they, they, it's, it's, it's all paid attention to. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and people so, have no idea what, what goes on there. They just think you, as long as he stays out of the way and does the count and all that, you know, that's all there is to it. And that, God, that's just a small fraction Oh, and by the way, that was uh, WrestleMania 19. 19. I think 19. Was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was right. I at least had a nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Ten years of there. Uh, but, yeah. but really, uh, what do you think, and with all that, and with, we've discussed, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, you know, being able to help these guys uh, with the match and uh, knowing where you're supposed to be in there, being able to uh, help them. Uh, what do you think, of all the ingredients, what makes a good referee? What do they need to have? Um, I think they have to be, I think, all right, so, especially today, um, they have to know what they are. They're a referee. That's exactly what you are. You're a referee. You're not a star. Mm -hmm. Nobody's buying a ticket to see your your ass. You're not putting any asses in seats. Um, You're a referee. That's what you are. Um, First, That's first and foremost. You're a referee. Um, I don't even know how much I can keep stressing it, but that's my biggest stress. You are a referee. You're not one of the boys. And in my opinion, a lot of the guys argue with me on this, but you're not you're not one of the boys in the locker room. Like in other words, I dress away from the boys and I do that on purpose because I, I was raised that way. Yeah. I'm a referee. I'm part of the show, absolutely. I'm I'm considered talent as far as payroll, but I'm not talent as far as what people are coming to watch and see. Um so that's the big part. You're a referee. Mm-hmm. Second of all, you have to have confidence in your abilities. You have to no matter who you're working with, it could be the biggest star on the planet or the worst star on the planet that everybody's pushing to be a star. It doesn't make any difference. You have to have confidence in your abilities that you can work through whatever body weaknesses may be. Even if it's your own, if they make your style change, you have to be willing to change your style. Once again, you're a referee. Yeah. Um, cadence is a huge part. 
um, where you where you can totally give away false finishes and just kill all the things the boys have built up for a match for a big false finish because you can't keep the same cadence throughout a match. Um, the biggest thing for me, another thing that's a big kicker for me is um, enforcing rules and meaning to enforce them. Uh, don't be afraid to get in there and do what you're really supposed to do. Act like it's real. Act like this is what you're supposed to do. There's so many times that I watch over and over and over again, and there's times I've done it too, so I'm not trying to say that I'm perfect. Sometimes it gets out of hand, and I get that. Mm -hmm. But you have to enforce the rules because that's what things are done in real life. Yeah. That's just yeah. the way they're done. Right. Um, you know, if a guy's not going to break at five, then count the son of a bitch out. Count him out one time. It's not going to hurt. Yeah. Because here's what's going to happen. The guy won't do it again, not during your match anyway. Right. You know what I mean? You have to do that stuff. And, yeah, because and otherwise teaches, people are not going to buy it after, you know, they're just, uh, you got to have some yeah, semblance. I mean, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Order, like I you mean, you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, and you just have to do things that, that make the boys mad because they want to do what they want to do, but you have rules or they don't, or, we, or there's no re reason for us to be in there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think those are the biggest keys for me. And, and also, I just think that there's lack of training, um, all over the place that, that, that could be make better referees more better. I know it's a terrible way of saying that, but make a good referee, uh, a, a much better referee just by the way he moves in the ring and where he stays in the ring and the way he moves, especially on TV, you know, house shows, you know, not so much, you know, you can move around and have a lot of freedom of the playground, but. You know, it's just uh, watching TV, just so much is missing with what they're supposed to be told and where they're supposed to be. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting that you talk about uh, how these guys like to have you in there. You know, you said that you could work with Brock or, you know, and Eddie, and you had this great relationship. And you hear, uh, you know, these wrestlers talk about that all the time, and it makes you understand how important that third man is in there. Because, like you said, if, if you don't have that, if you don't create that in the ring, that this is, uh, you know, we've got uh, sanctioned rules here and you got to follow them. And, of course, you know, I can't be everywhere and you're going to be able to sneak some things in here or whatever. But you've got to mm -hmm. create that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, illusion or whatever you want to call it. Otherwise, like you said, what are you doing in there? And then what is it? What, what is this match? It's just these two guys, you know, throwing each other all over the place. So it, it really is important. Yeah, yeah. it is. And and the it's other a, thing, a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry to me to cut you off. No. There's a there's a lost art that some of the boys don't even understand anymore, like how to use their referees to get themselves over. There's so many times oh. where they put the heat on me. I don't want the heat. Mm -hmm. I want you to have the heat. Don't give it to me. They're gonna boo me. Yeah, I'm gonna get booed probably more than you because they just can't wait for a referee to screw up or to yeah. get the or to do what they're not supposed to do. And, and, and that's a lost art. Like, there's so many guys that know how to do it so well where they use their referees and all the heat goes to him, and, and that's what you want. You don't want the referee, unless it's a spot or something you kind of do to involve a referee, you don't want me or Jimmy Corderas or any of these referees to have the heat. That doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that's another lost art. It's just a lost art that so many guys just don't have anymore. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very true. Um but it's it's changed a lot over the years, and like I said, there was a point where, uh, you know, they were personalities. You guys were personalities, but at the same time, uh, you guys also realized that you weren't the show. It, it just it just you know played into whatever the storyline might have been, and those those to me yeah. were the best. And uh, you know, it's like you said that you dressed in a different area. You it, you were always separate in that sense. I'm sure you had some great friends. I did too, but I, you know, I had great advice early on when I first got there uh, from Gorilla Monsoon. To, he told me that uh, just remember you're not one of them, and you never will be. And as long as you remember that, you're gonna you're gonna be okay. And I never yep. did, and I didn't mix the two. I was friendly. I had you know I had I had real friends there, but at the same time, I never uh, tried to put myself into it into that uh, that circle of people and say, hey, yeah, it's us. You know, no, no, that's not true. And it's interesting right. you say that, that that was even the case with uh, with referees, or the, at least the ones that yeah. were good. I mean, <laughs> really knew uh, the business. Right. 
Yeah. Well, there's 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 also a little quick story I wanted to tell you about. Uh, you know, you said that that referees, you know, were more of a personality at one era or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, th- this is a really strange story. Um, and I was all in at first until I was given advice. But I'll just tell you what happened. I was on an overseas flight, uh, and we were flying. I can't remember where we were going. It doesn't matter. But anyway, we were flying. And, uh, we were on a private uh, airline, private uh, airline for overseas, and we were bored and having some drinks and you know eating or whatever. And uh, we decided to do uh, have a little wrap off. Well, <clears throat> I was doing beatboxing for John Cena and uh, Shelton Benjamin. Um, there was a bunch of us that all tried to get in there, and I would do the beatbox thing, which is if you, anybody doesn't know what beatboxing is, it's where you make the beat with your mouth, and it's supposed to make them rap off much better. Um, so anyway, um, apparently Stephanie McMahon had heard me do this and she really dug it and she really thought it was really, really neat. So I don't even know if you know this song, but there was a couple segments I've done on WWE television that involved me doing the beatbox with Kurt Angle, John Cena, Funaki, um, a couple other ones. But anyway, well, this became kind of a, thing where people really liked it uh, they thought it was really neat so i was approached and, and was told or asked not to not told but asked if i was interested in being the manager for john cena early in his beginning years uh oh really before he's the john yeah yeah before, yeah, bef- before he he's the john he was today yeah yeah he would come out remember he didn't really have yeah. music it was just him rapping all the way yeah. down yeah well they thought what about this heat we have with this white boy who raps mm-hmm. with this skinny little white kid that's beatboxing all the way down to the ring. And of course I would do all the dirty stuff, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And that would be the deal. I was like, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. Um, I thought about it and I actually wanted to do it. That's, 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 uh, you don't have to tell everybody that, but I kind of wanted to do it. Sure. Why? I and mean, then, that would have been a blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I talked to the undertaker. And yeah. the Undertaker said, let me explain something to you, boy. And I said, okay. And he said, if that thought registers through your mind again, I will smack the snot out of you <laughs> and all the brain cells that you have. And I said, okay. Yeah. Do, you, do I need to explain to you why? Yeah. And I said, well, can I tell you why I want to do it? No, there's no reason for you to want to do this. I said, okay, I guess I don't have a choice. So, yeah, I guess you need to tell me why I shouldn't do this. He says, do you know Danny Davis? And I said, yeah. He goes, where is he at now? Mm. And I said, I don't know. He goes, you're one of the best referees in the business with a long, long longevity and shelf life. Mm. You do this gimmick and it don't work, or at some point it it doesn't work to where you're involved anymore, then what do you have? Yeah, you're dead. And I said, I don't know. Well, I can't ever go back to being a referee because so, you'll never be qualified and looked at as a, a legit yeah. referee anymore. It'll be credible. Yeah. I said, okay, well, I guess I don't want to be Brian the Beatbox Boy. <laughs> and he said, no, you carry your skinny ass to the locker room and put your referee shit on. And I said, okay. <laughs> and that was the end story. of that. Yeah, well, that was uh, <laughs> tremendous advice, I'd say. You know? But that was, I, was, I had a chance. I had a chance. Yeah. But, uh, you know. And I look back at it now, and I thought, wow, that was that would have been really cool, and it really probably would have worked for a little bit. Yeah. But, man, it would have been really, he's right, it would have probably burnt me up. I'd have probably been not even around the business anymore, probably. Yeah, you would have been uh, a, a footnote, uh, you know, a trivia. Uh, you know, exactly. Who's, who's John Cena? <laughs> but, you know, that's, uh, it, it, but like you said, it would have been fun. It would have been a great memory, but it would have uh, cost you too much on the other end. Um, yeah. So you're talking, I mean, it was what, about a five year run with the WWE? I think it was, I, I, I'm six not sure. Thousand, five, not six, somewhere in that area, five or six sure. years, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, a tremendous experience. It was what, uh, what, why did it end? I mean, uh, you were uh, one of the best they had. Um, honestly, I think it was a combination of, me not being as responsible as I should have been. And then uh, I believe that with what went down with my dad, my uncle, which, um, which I have my own theory on, uh, I guess the stigma of my name being Hebner and that the other two not wanting to be around and be a part of it mm-hmm. was just a matter of time. Yeah. 
Well, that's and a- I can't blame it all just on them or, or or WWE. I mean, there was moments where I was irresponsible, and I mean, I want everybody to know that. I mean, I was young, I was dumb, like all the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I had some moments that you know shouldn't have happened, but I don't think those are the reasons why I'm not there. I just think that the reason why I'm not there, and my honest opinion, is because of what went down with my dad and my uncle, which is another, in my opinion, bullshit mm-hmm. uh, story. Um, but it, it is what it is, and ultimately things happen for a reason. And, and, and believe it or not, uh, I, I'm, I'm good with it. I'm not mad with it anymore. I'm not upset. Um, I look back on it and think the think the WWE for the years that that I was there and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good now. I'm happy. Uh, so. Yeah. And I, you know, we, I had that conversation with your dad too, and I know he's still, he's still bitter over it. Um, but that, and folks, and if you didn't uh, know or aware of it and we won't really get into it, but it was over merchandise, I believe. And, and, uh, um, miss big misunderstandings, misunderstandings on both ends of this, but it's unfortunate that, you know, stuff like that happens because, you know your your uh, your dad and your uncle were uh, certainly a huge part of of that you know part of history in the WWF and part of some of the greatest matches that ever took place and uh, and you're part of that legacy too. But it's uh, you know it's it's unfortunate that things like that had had happened with with uh, with your dad and I hope that someday that that's corrected. I do too. That you know, that's my only hope, man. Um, I, I don't, I don't care about me uh, as far as it goes. Mm-hmm. I really don't. I mean, uh, I, what I do want one day, and I hope it would 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 turn out this way, is that you know somebody can bite cheek and ass, and and just one way or the other, whether whoever it may be, and just say, you know what, let's 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 do give you the respect you do deserve and what you did good and what y'all were great at, and you know, because I've seen it happen over and over again for other people. Yeah. Um, and if if anybody knows the details of what they were supposed to be doing, which is the most, I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to get into it, but right. uh, it, it's minute compared to what people did to WWE and Vince McMahon. It, it's it's minute um, and very very petty comparative to what other people have done that have been into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, um, that have come back. I mean, more than, more than once. I mean, that's what that that, that that's my point. Yeah. And I mean, you can't bring back a, the the two guys that were a staple in that company for twenty yeah. plus yeah. years yeah. Uh, to to just acknowledge and say whether you like me or not. Let's acknowledge that they did a hell of a job while they were there and what they were doing. Yeah. I mean, to me, that would be my that would be like my highlight for for not only my dad but my uncle Dave. Um, because they did work hard for that company. Um, they did sweat blood tears. They, they, you know, they, they gave it all. Like I said earlier in this interview, when we first started, I mean, uh, you know, both of those guys, just like myself, are passionate people that care about what we do. Um, and then they're, they're, they're no different than I am. And that, that's just, that would just be my hope. Uh, will it ever happen? I don't know. I think, uh, the WWE would be, um, very sad without doing that, but it is what it is, man. I can't control it. Never will. And it is what it is. Yeah, and, and of course, a, a, another big incident uh, that involved your dad was, the, you know, the Montreal screw job. And um, how big of a toll did that take on him? Because, you know, we had, uh, I've, I've talked to him about it, and he's talked to several people about it, that, you know, it's one of those situations like, what the hell do you do? I don't know if anybody was in a more difficult situation uh, in that whole, uh, you know, that whole way that played out than your dad. I mean, I just... I don't. I don't envy anybody who had to be in that position and and make a decision. I mean, really, it was either, and, and we you know talked to him about it, and it really came down to: do I want to keep working here, or do I, you know, do what uh, you know the rest of the world thinks that they was honorable or something? Right. It, to me, to me, it's a matter of this, Sean. It's like this: if you love your job and you're getting paid very, very well to do it, and you're getting ready to do it. And before you can even go to do your job, which you're getting set to go do, yeah. and someone says, you say this, or you don't say this. Yeah. And if you don't say this, I think you know what the, what the, what the repercussion is going to be. Mm-hmm. So be in your best interest to say this. They're going out there and get them. Right. Um, I, I don't know too many people in my life that I've ever ran into that have had that predicament. I really don't. No. Um, no. I wouldn't want that predicament. Um, so with that being said, you know, was it unfair of my dad to have to do this? Absolutely. 
Um, was it, once again, passion for the business that he loved and the passion that he had for the company he worked for? Absolutely. Um, but there was also a measure of, he probably didn't feel like he had a choice. Um, and believe it or not, this, these are things that, and people would find this probably very interesting. These are not things that me and my dad sit around when we're having some cold ones and cooking steaks on the grill that we just sit around and talk about because, honestly, that's between him and his feelings, and that's between the way he feels as a, as a man. You know, I, I, I don't like digging in some, some man's mind, even being my father, on something such a big deal. You know, because this is a big deal and a big thing that happened to him. I get the just of it, and I get enough of it to what I know, enough that I need to know. Yeah. But I don't need to dig and crawl more, you know, into it. Yeah, but I'll tell you, I mean, uh, when we we had the discussion, uh, you know, you could say what you want, but it wasn't as though, okay, this man is making a choice of of continuing to make a living, or, or, you know, or, Brett, are you going to, uh, you know, support me? You know, (laughs) know, are you going, I mean, really, that's, that's I, I like I said I I just can't believe uh, what to have to have gone through that uh, situation just had to be awful I mean I, I uh, because there was no right choice in, in a sense because no there there, there wasn't you're yeah. right there was no win there was yeah. no win at all yeah but, you want to jump into a fire or you want to yeah. jump off a plane yeah you want to go lava you want to do the lava train <laughs> right right <Which> <laughs> I mean you know yeah. But you I, know, I don't even know if you know. Yeah, go ahead. You know, earlier that day, yeah. earlier that day, before my dad knew anything, Brett, I don't know if you knew, came to him and said, "Earl, is anything squirrely going on?" And he said, "No." He says, "You swear on your kids, you won't do anything to me." He says, "Brett, I swear my kids, I won't do anything to you. I'm going in there like every other match, brother." He said, "Okay." So then people wonder why there was so much heat with my dad and him. But there you go. I mean, come on, there you go. And well, I don't even think it was a matter of that my dad did it. I think it was a matter of Brett talking to him before. And finding out swearing on his kids, which my dad would never swear on me and my sisters and that kind of thing. He would never do that if he knew what he knew. Yeah. He would run away from the conversation, if anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you say at or the time, he didn't, he didn't have any idea. It was uh, that. No. Uh, yeah. No. Before he went out there. Well, uh, you know, regardless of all that, uh, you know, this, the, the legacy that those, your dad and, and his brother, uh, left with that company is, is just amazing. And uh, it's just uh, great that you had that opportunity to be there as well. Um, you left the company and then did you just want to get out of the business for a while? I mean, uh, or, or. Um, I, I was, I was really pretty, pretty bitter um, because I wasn't let go right away. I was told that I was going to be suspended mm-hmm. um, for 60 days. I believe it was 60 days, 90 days, uh, whatever it was. I can't remember. And was told to call back, and so I did, and then was told that they had nothing for me, which was the ultimate spit in the face. Because how do you not have anything for a referee? Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to have matches anymore. I mean, what, I mean, what the hell? So anyway, it was another slap in the face. And then um, I had just kind of I laid low, man. I just kind of laid low. I quit watching wrestling altogether. Um, just kind of got things put back together, um, and then I kind of figured out that I wanted to get back in the business ultimately, but not with them. You know what I mean? That wasn't where I was trying to beg to crawl to go back to. Yeah. Um, and then I was offered an opportunity at uh, TNA Impact Wrestling. Which, and, the, and what was uh, it that brought you back, though? I mean, did you feel that that was, uh, you know, a, a great organization to, if you were going to go to work, back to work, you wanted to do it with them? Um, honestly, I, I, I felt like this was an opportunity that God had given, um, and I'll tell you why. Because remember when I told you we did the, the brand split? Yeah. And I was really upset with my dad because we weren't working together. Yeah. You know, he was on Raw, traveling opposite with me different days. Well, I thought this was my opportunity to be able to work with my dad where we can both do the things that we love to do together. So I thought it was a great opportunity for me to do that, as well as, as I listened to him talk about at the time how great that, that, that would be for the company because they were in need of rest and thought that that place was great and thought the locker room was great and so i said you know what let's 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 let's, let's do this yeah some old friends there too right <laughs> yes 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 uh-huh yeah so uh let's let's fast forward though to because uh, i've kept you a while but um 
with what you're doing now. And, and, uh, it, it really, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's so much fun to watch because it has this, uh, old school feel, but also, uh, it, it's kind of on the edge of what's ahead, you know, with Billy and Dave, uh, you know, where they, they, uh, you know, especially Billy's very aware of, you know, social media and the power of all these different platforms. Uh, so from your view, when, when this opportunity came up, and I know that you had some other opportunities that you could have taken, why, why NWA? Well, first and foremost, it's because I believed in what Dave and Billy's vision was, and I stuck by them. Yeah. When there were other things I could have done, and you're exactly right, I could have. Um, I just believed them. Um, I, I, I've, I've been good friends with, with Dave for a long time, and Billy for a long time, and in all honesty, I, I, I had it laid out to me. I thought it sounded kind of weird um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not used to that. to that. Yeah, you're used to those big arenas. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I believed, and I wasn't going to take the high road because I didn't believe, and because there were supposedly better chances in a bigger stage. Yeah. So I, I, I decided to stick it out and hang in there, and and roll with what I am so, so excited about, which is the NWA. Um, I just, I'm, I, I really have a rejuvenated life right now, and it's hard to explain because I so, 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 so much love um, the locker room, the wrestling style, the studio feel, um, the feedback. Um, this is something exciting. Um, this is something different. This is not your everyday wrestling that you're watching three days a week. Um, this is another platform you can have and look at that gives you a true alternative to pro wrestling. Um, this lets you see people act in different ways as far as their, their, their platform there, as far as being able to do a promo with no script, um, put on a match without flipping out of the ring and going into the crowd and jumping off the, the, the beams across the, the, the ceiling. Um, you know, this is a true visual difference that you can see with an alternative. And I'm just so excited about it, man. I really am. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than I just wish it, each and every one of your listeners gives it a try because you may not like it at the first try. Just like, it's like, to me, it's like when you listen to an album the first time from a favorite artist of your own yeah. and you just go, man, this is just not as good as the other one. Yeah. And then ultimately it ends up being your favorite album because you gave it another chance and you kept listening to it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the same thing. Um, to me, it was first, when I first saw it, I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, and, you know, I think a lot of people have, but it's really, really interesting. And, and, and Billy's and, and, and Dave's vision to me so far has been very, very, very good. You know, and I, uh, I had a conversation with Nick uh, not too long ago, and I talked about that roster that you guys have. And it's not, it's not a, a, a big roster, but every one of these, uh, these personalities is so unique and uh, they're damn good in front of a microphone in front of the, uh, the camera and they know how, how to perform exceptionally well in the ring. But from your viewpoint and you've been around uh, the best of the best, what is it about these guys that uh, you think is capturing the attention of so many people? Well, once again, I'll go back to a thing mean you referenced earlier. This feels like an old school locker room. Yeah. Um, this feels like guys that want to work together to make this thing work. There are guys that want to work together to make each and every one of us, not including myself, but make each and every one of us stars. Um, this, this just is what it's like a chance for somebody to do something different. Um, and you get to do it and you want to work hard for it. Uh, there's, there's, there's no egos right now. And I'm not saying that none of this can change, but right now the presence of, the presence of NWA right now is this way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just feel everyone is working for the same goal, which is not always the case. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where I feel it's a lot different back there. And I think that, that Dave and, and Billy know what they want to hire because I think they do a lot of scouting, man. And, uh, I think they see things that other people don't and, and it's showing that some of these people that they don't, that other people don't want are like, wow, why, why didn't so-and-so get them? Or why isn't he on so-and-so? And it's because, you know, it's, it's what they're handpicking at this point, you know? 
Yeah, and you're also seeing uh, you see a real connection to these fans, and uh, you know, and and I think in a sense they kind of feel like it's it's theirs. You know, like they they're in on the ground floor with you guys, and uh, as they continue to build this, and now uh, going to have the uh, Circle Squared show, uh, which is going to allow some of these independents to come in and and show their stuff and uh, in front of the camera and in the ring. And then the fans also are going to be participating in this as well. So uh, do you get that feeling too, that there's this connection, that a real connection between the fans, the, the people that are, uh, you know, growing and, and watching this and, uh, and the NWA, the new NWA? I really, I, yes, I do. I really do. Um, I, if you've never been there, which I'm talking to all your listeners and also you, Sean, if you've never been there. Not yet. You gotta, you gotta go. Yeah. You gotta go because there is a presence there. Yeah. There, there is a presence there that is so different. Um, yes, you're right. That, that is a great way to explain it. I, I think it's their show. Um, like in other words, they're not acting like idiots and piling around things just to get attention, just so they can be the star. What I mean by their show, like they want to cheer and boo what they believe in, and they believe in the product that's being put out there. Um, I truly think that going through my social media and reading NWA social media and things of that nature, you, you, you hit it right on the head. Um, I think that fans feel like this is their, their, their show. Yeah. This is their different stuff. They want to watch. Um, and I really think it's cool, man. Um, I don't know about the term you use. I love it though. Um, I don't know if it's a movement. I hope it is. Mm-hmm. Um, feels like it is. Um, but I do hope it is. Yeah. Well, and then, and I don't even want to call it, it's not an alternative. It is just different, you know, and it's got this this uh, vibe to it that it, it is. It kind of takes you back. It's it's great for people who were, you know, fortunate enough to have lived during the, the era of the territories and these organizations that, uh, you know, had their weekly television shows at a local station somewhere and people go in there. And then it's also got this, you know, you see young people in that crowd, too, who have kind of caught on to this. And it's cool. You know, it's just cool for, to them. And so, I mean, I just think it has it all. And I'm just I'm, I'm loving watching it develop. And you see every week, uh, you know, with the different shows, yeah. I think they're they're eight in uh, at this point. And it's uh, it, it's it's really fun to watch. And, and uh, Brian, I want to I want to really th- I want to thank you for coming on. It, it's great for me to uh, be able to talk to you uh, about. Uh, that that time and and then see and then hearing your perspective of what was going on with your uh, dad and uncle and and now you're 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 now part of this this new generation and uh it, it's great it's great seeing you in that ring thank you very much Sean. i really do appreciate it and when i knew i was going to do this i was very very excited about doing it um, I, you were like one of my, my one of the guys i looked up to as well and i actually you may not but i remember meeting you many many years ago as a young kid um, so it was an honor to do this and I'm, I'm really glad you asked me to do this. And, um, uh, I had a lot of fun and, um, I really do want to invite you down to, uh, to the, to the GPS, uh, studios one day and, uh, come check us out. Well, I hope I get there soon. Hey, um, how can folks follow you? Um, they can follow me on Twitter at baby Hebner. Um, not big in the Instagram. I used to be a lot better, but I'm not anymore. But you can do the same thing on Instagram, and it's at Baby Hebner as well. Um, and that's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> all right. Well, folks, that's how you can uh, get in touch. All right, Brian, thank you so much for coming on Primetime, and uh, I hope we run into each other soon. I do too. Thank you so much for having me.